Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice. Giving you a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let's preview what's coming up in this episode. Creating controllable speed and power is a must-have to compete in rotational sports such as golf, tennis, and baseball. Today, we welcome our guest, Dr. Greg Rose, to help us unlock this idea in our season five premiere. Greg brings a wealth of knowledge in the subject as the co-founder of Tylus Performance Institute and founder of OnBase University and Racket Fit based in San Diego. On this episode, we cover durability versus performance, the impact of strength training in season versus off season, and how to decipher between mobility or stability problems to unleash more power. So let's spin up this season of the Movement Podcast powered by FMS. All right, really excited to have uh, Dr. Greg Rose on with us today. Uh, he's one of the one of the partners here at FMS, and we've known Greg probably going over twenty some years now, going way back when, even before he was with Tylus. And he's the director of the Tylus Performance Institute. And if you don't know Greg, he, he's definitely taking care of some of the world's top golfers. But one thing, Greg, I'm, I'm going to start this off and, and probably get you to expand a little bit on what you're doing in baseball. Um, since we're coming into baseball season, and I know you've taken a lot of what you've been doing in golf and apply, start applying to baseball. So give us a little bit of insight on that as we get this thing started. Yeah, so I think most people uh, probably have seen the stuff we've done with golf at, here at TPI, at Touch Performance Institute. But um, we actually took some of the same things we're doing, which are sports-specific, let's say movement screens, and, t- and tying that what we call the body sport connection together. And we applied it to baseball and tennis, believe it or not. So we actually launched a business called On Base University, Uh, in the end of 2017. It was really something we were doing for a bunch of the MLB teams. We've actually certified half of the teams, 15 organizations, most of their coaching, medical, and fitness staff on how to do this type of movement screening and working with the athletes. And then we kind of branched it out to to anybody. So now we've got, you know, some of the top NCAA colleges and we've got the high school coaches. Um, So kind of what we've done for golf, we have this on-base university. We obviously have two major assessments that we look at, a hitting assessment and pitching. Right now we have baseball pitching, we have fast pitch softball pitching class coming soon. Um, Hitting obviously applies both to hitting and softball. And then we also, uh, which a lot of people don't know, in 2017 launched something with the United States Professional Tennis Association called Racket Fit, which is obviously doing the same thing with tennis players. And we have a serve class that we do now, and we have a ground strokes class that's launching again this year as well. same thing, it's rinse, repeat, right? Like you said, we're old, we've known each other for a long time, and it's basically taking these old methods and applying it just to a, a, a new sport. But as you guys know, you know, movement's movement, athletes are athletes, they all need the same stuff, right? And I guess the, the, two, way, the two sides of the penny you look at are you're creating durability, but you're creating durability in one of the hardest patterns to master, which is rotational power and speed. So that seems to be the common thread. Not only are people looking for performance enhancement because of all that you got behind you in that 3D bay, but I think everybody assumes if we get that performance enhancement, somehow we're vaccinated to the next most possible injury, repetitive motion and a rotational uh, speed right. could give us. So how do, you, how do you work both sides of the penny and are yeah, most well, people are only interested in one side? <laughs> well, I think you already know the answer to this, but you know, you say, when you say durability, that is not normally the uh, number one thing that comes to mind. They're thinking performance right off the get-go, right? So you got a young 24-year-old athlete. They just want to wanna hit the ball as hard as possible, throw the ball as hard as possible, kick the ball as hard as possible, and they're not thinking durability. But the good news is I think, you know, in the past, I think, Greg, we'd always say that maybe those aren't, you know, those don't live together. Things that you would do to optimize power hurt your durability. But I think the more we've learned about this is that the more efficient your movements are, right, it's what I call free power, right? So it's, it's basically efficiency. One of the definitions of efficiency is I can optimize power or create the most power with the least amount of effort, right? So as we create these efficiencies of movements, not only are the players creating more power, but they don't have to work as hard to create the power, which by definition means durability is going to increase, which is, which is pretty cool. You know what I mean? Now, well, most what- injuries are associated with fatigue. So if you're if you're teaching a skill the way I see it, the, the longer you can go in a skill session without an erosion of some of that primary stability, balance, motor control, the better the skill session went. So. Yeah, think, think about this. Like people know in golf, right? Or maybe they don't know. Our guys start playing professionally, you know, some people in their late teens, but usually early 20s. 
And in this sport here in golf, uh, I got guys that are making two, three, four million dollars in their 60s, right? So I, when I have this conversation with these young 22 year olds, 23 year olds, I'm like, listen, I just want you to understand, like, if you do this right, you can make <laughs> millions for the next 40 years. But what's the most important thing for the next 40 years? Your body. We got to keep this efficient. We got to keep it moving. And I was just with a, a field goal kicker from the NFL, and you would think, oh, it's NFL. I mean, how long is that lifespan? He's hoping to kick till he's 50. Right. I'm going, I never even thought like in the NFL that 50 was an option, but he, he's probably right as a kicker. So like some of these sports, I don't think the young kids are thinking like, you know, it's so easy to be like, uh, let, what's important now. But if you can pace yourself on the PGA tour or LPGA, I mean, is there another, another sport that you can make millions for 40 plus years? That's no, a big deal. No, it's, it's ridiculous. And so you're, you're actually cultivating durability and performance enhancement. And that's what I think people, when, when we go into that word efficiency, you're, you're basically saying efficiency speaks to both sides of the coin. You're going to be more adaptable if you need to adapt if you're efficient, and you're going to be more durable if you need to stay right there and do more reps if you're efficient. So, you know, and that's one thing I'd like everybody to know. You were very instrumental in the engineering of the SFMA and the fact that we're doing our musculoskeletal exam now, not just sprinting toward the diagnosis, but also hedging our bet all the way down the rabbit hole with a DN, which is a dysfunctional non-painful pattern. We tally those up like a score scoreboard because on the other side of this diagnosis, we're all going to arrive at pretty much the same diagnosis if we're good at musculoskeletal, but you and I and, and some of our uh, our instructors really try to preach the fact that you can't make a prognosis without knowing all the other chinks in the foundation. So yeah. rehabbing a back with a dorsiflexion problem and without, those are two different things. And I know you've been on many workshops where they're already into the core. They're not even clearing the ankles. They're not even clearing balance. And you're like, if all things were good, this would be a great approach, but you just left a lot of virals <laughs> on board. A hundred percent. You know, I, I think something fundamental that I think most that we should talk about that I think a lot of people get wrong is like, what's the purpose of these movement screens? SFMA being a movement screen, the FMS obviously being a movement screen. You know, I, I think a lot of people get this wrong. I see people doing research on, on things that just make me laugh. But if you think about like, why are we looking for the DNs? Why are we doing these movement screens, right? So to me, the most important thing that everybody needs to understand is a movement screen doesn't tell me if my player is going to make it to the PGA Tour or not, right? I mean, I've got guys that failed the FMS that made it to the PGA Tour. We've got guys in the NBA that failed an FMS. It doesn't tell me if you're going to be the best athlete in the world. It doesn't tell me if you're going to suck. It, what it, and it really doesn't tell me if you're going to be injured or not. What it really tells me is it helps me understand why you do it that way. Right now, that's doesn't that seems like such a uh, obvious basic thing. But if I understand why you move the way you move, or why you swing the way you swing, or why you throw a ball the way you throw a ball, everything starts to make sense. And the DNN, the DNs to me, it's the same thing when we're talking about health or, or pain. Is when I see the DNs, I go, oh, no wonder your lower back does all the work and it falls apart because it, it it starts to it starts to paint the investigation story. Right, if you're the detective. And you start to go, well, now you, you can't look at something locally. You have to look globally because now the whole story starts to emerge in front of you. And you're like, well, no wonder their foot does that. It's, well, if I was their brain, that's how I would move their hip too. And that, once I understand that, well, that affects the gait. And then actually, if they were to swing, it could, oh, okay, now. And once you get that light bulb and you're like, this all makes sense, the way you attack these from a treatment standpoint, you know, from a conditioning or treatment, or even from a teaching, coaching standpoint, it all changes. I mean, your entire perspective changes because now it's not a hip it's this human in front of you with these altered movements and you're trying to put the whole piece together. And that's, I think that's why all of us get such great success. Well, Greg, now that you're, you know, with, with on base, you, you're starting to talk to, or basically educate the coaches in that concept, you know, yep. cause a coach, basically what you just said is a, is a athlete, let's say a high school pitcher is throwing a certain way and maybe using their arm more than they need to, because they don't have enough, hip mobility, whatever it is, you go in yep. there, how, how well the coach is embracing that thought process? Because now they should know, wow, now I know why this kid is throwing the ball the wrong way. Let's put it this way. I know teams now in MLB that won't hire you unless you're you know, FMS and on-base certified. I mean, because it, it's like I said, it's a different way of looking at players. It's, it's one of those things where before we used to say, oh, you got Tommy Johns. What's, what's wrong with your elbow? 
okay, people who are educated now go, well, the elbow is just the result. It's not the cause, right? Let's try and understand the way they move. And I would tell you that, you know, the cool thing about this is, you know, there's this, there's this clash in baseball recently with, or not recently, over the last 10 years with technology, the, the new wave of stuff and the old school stuff. Well, what we're doing, like this is, this kind of feeds both, right? So it's like the old school guys love this because they're like, well, now it makes sense. I, I understand. I, I could see why they're doing it. I just didn't know why they were doing it. And this helps me understand why they're doing it. And the new technology people come in and go, well, that's why we're seeing this on the 3D graphs or the biomechanics. So in a weird way, it's almost connects the two. So it's been incredibly positively received in baseball, which is a hard thing to do, by the way. No. And, I- uh, you know, and it's like the same thing. I'm excited about the uh, player's way. I don't know if you guys have talked about that with with MLBPA, but I, it, even getting the kids and the parents to start understanding this concept connects all the dots, and that's what's so cool about it. One of the one of the things that that I think allowed you and I to collaborate on, in so many different ways on on your side of the world and on the West Coast with Titleist and what we've been doing over here is when you and I started sort of making our hierarchy of exercise. Because we had we had to we can't just talk about the problem. I think you and I both feel obligated to talk about the solution. And if you're looking at something as low tech as an FMS, and mm-hmm. something as high tech as a the the 3D technology you got behind you, and they both agree, then all we really got to do is agree on the transferable exercise that makes my side of the fence in generic fundamental movement archetypes and your side of the fence in sports specific skill acquisition look the same. So we started mm-hmm. connecting on stuff like chops and lifts, single leg deadlifts, rolling. It, we would uh, make tweaks to the old fashioned cat and camel. We would do all different kinds of things, but we didn't make my test look, look worse and yours look better or yours look worse and mine look better, we just kept looking at those exercise, manual therapy, soft tissue tweaks that look good on both sides of the fence and said, uh, what's better than that? We just balance the system at a low primitive level, which tells us my automatic subconscious responses to perturbation, balance, and movement pattern are good. And we still have a conscious skill coordination laid on top of that. And, and so... Once we've got two measuring sticks, it's not hard fleshing out the best exercises because we're gonna, you and I are both gonna have 26 ideas, but we let both test, give them both thumbs up, and then we argue for, all right, what's the quickest and has the least equipment? <laughs> what's the easiest? Because again, I don't care who they are, they, everybody wants easy, nobody wants hard, right? So that's what I want our <laughs> listeners to hear. We didn't go into the skill specific world or the fundamental. Uh, generic preparedness world, we wanted to see thumbs up on both sides of that. So to, to, the, to the listeners out there, if you don't know how to measure both sides, just figure out which side you're most confident with and invest a little bit in the other side. And when you're trying to decide what works best here, look for thumbs up on both sides of the functional fence and the specific fence. 100%. I know this is hard to believe, but this body, I'm not a field goal kicker, right? So, um, <laughs> but I, like I said, like yesterday I'm working with a field goal, one of the best field goal kickers in the NFL, right? And back to your point there, Gray, is, is I don't know anything about field goal kicking, right? But I understand body movement, human movements, and I understand efficiency from a biomechanics standpoint. And the cool thing about this, like, like you're saying, is that if one gets better, the other one almost always gets better too. So it's, it's one of those things where we could take the same principles, apply it, and you said... Uh, low tech from the FMS and high tech from biomechanics. I actually would switch that around. I think the FMS is much more high tech. Like to be able to do a overhead squat requires a lot more, you know, uh, uh, brain power and things working properly than just looking at how much hip rotation you have, right? But right. I, what I, what I love seeing this is I love seeing that in the 3D motion capture. I think a lot of people think that when we hook players up under sensors, like if I hook this kicker up. I guess I'm looking at like how much his hip turns or how much his, what's his foot angle at. And we can do all that. It's great. That's not the power of this. The power of this is the 3D motion capture can actually measure efficiency, like we talked about. How easy is it for them to do the movements that they're doing? And that's where they, they 100% connect, right? Because we can see it on FMS that that didn't look easy. It looked like you're struggling, right? And when I see that looks like they're struggling there and we go look at the efficiency under 3D motion capture, you can see that it's not very efficient either. They're struggling with what they're doing over here. But when that looks efficient, 
and we come over and look, all of a sudden we go, hey, it makes sense. This looks efficient too. That's when we knew we had something, right? I mean, that's really the, the entire, the light bulb motion that went off when we connected those two dots. No, I'm glad you mentioned the overhead deep squat because so many people say, hey, what's your favorite way to look at you know, upper body, lower body dissociation. I think I'm going to go with rolling or some type of standing rotation maneuver or something like that. I'm like, overhead deep squat, man. When I see somebody that can put a golf club or a baseball bat or a PVC stick overhead, rock bottom a squat, I'm not really looking at the nuances of the segments of their lumbar spine. I know we're going to have a little bit of rounding because there's no load on the system. So the system doesn't have to be nearly as stable as, as a, a, somebody would want it in a back squat. However, when I see you effortlessly pursue full shoulder flexion and full hip flexion at the same time, and your spine doesn't go through a hiccup, it just rock bottom and up, then I know when we get into rotation or even a reciprocal effort like running or throwing or something like that, we may have a stability problem, but we don't have a freedom problem. And, and you and I sat in the back of a workshop one time and somebody was really just throwing out every 13 letter word they had. And we basically just said, Hey, if we could reduce this conversation to freedom of control, if you can't, if you can't demonstrate you have freedom, I don't need to talk about your level of control because you're a victim of your stiffness. And if you demonstrate freedom, I know exactly how to test control. Cause we just start making movement patterns more complex. Dude, somebody asked me the other day, they're like, if I have no money and I and and literally uh, every dollar matters, how can I get started? I'm like, have enough space to do an overhead deep squat and get a dynamometer, check their grip strength. I mean, those two things, I mean, let's think about this. Like in all seriousness, if you have an athlete come in and I see them peg 70 kilograms, with, let's say grip strength on both hands and they can peg a full overhead deep squat, I already know I'm dealing with an advanced mover and pretty good strength. And I'm like, that's a pretty good start. Like you don't need fancy equipment to, to make some pretty basic um, assumptions about what, what you're staring at. Does that make sense? And, and, and so much of what you said, people hear us go back and forth. What you and I are really uncovering in a low grip strength or a unilateral low grip strength is before I ever assume somebody is head to toe weak, there could be some degree of inhibition there. So if you can't deep squat and you've got a, you know, an unfavorable grip strength, I honestly think that anything that makes your deep squat look better will probably unburden some of your authentic strength. And if it still ain't good enough, then we can start doing a little bit of training. But I have seen grip strength change when we basically allow the body to line up. And I don't care whether you want to argue from a fascial, neurological, or core stability standpoint. Yeah. When you've got good organized alignment and motion, you express more inherent strength than you would when you've got kinks in the hose. And so many people are trying to train strength when they got in inhibition on board, you know? So, dude, here's a this, I, this might be totally off topic, but I think it's a cool story. Uh, yesterday, we have the LPGAs in town here, playing here at, uh, in San Diego. And uh, I had seven of the girls here yesterday, and one of them... Uh, one of the best players in, in LPGA comes to me and says, uh, I don't know what's going on, but my, 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 my distance on my driver's down and it's driving me crazy. Everything's going great, but I've just, I've lost this power and, uh, I'm, I want to get on the force plates. I want to get on the 3d. I've got my swing coach here. I want to see kind of what's going on. I'm like, let's, let's just, let's just check some movements real quick, real fast. Right. So we go through and we, and I, she was here six months ago. So I have all of her data from six months ago and she's a incredible mover. Very, very very mobile, very stable. We go through the movement screen, dude, she nailed it. I mean, everything looked great. I'm like, okay, well, that, that's not a problem. And she's like, you know, I've, I've been feeling like um, that I've been, I've been something physically has been off. And I'm like, well, no, it's not that. That looks great, that looks great. We go, we do grip strength, grip strength, great. Even improved from the last time I saw her. Okay. We go do vertical jump. I check her vertical jump. Vertical jumps down 7%. And I'm like, Hmm. I go, you probably, I go, let's check your, let's do, we do sit up and throw and chest pass for upper body and core power. We do some medicine ball tests. They're down six and a half percent. So vertical jumps down 7%. These are down six and a half percent. I'm like, man, your power is down. She's like, that's what I'm saying. I go look at the, uh, we get her on the, our launch monitor. She hits driver distance is down six and a half percent. Right. So I look at this and I go, okay, so here's the good news and bad news. There's nothing wrong with your swing, right? Your swing is, looks great. It's, equally down to what we see with your power in the gym, right? So we know this is an Indian problem, not an arrow problem. Like, so is it the arrow or is it the Indian, right? Is it the athlete or is it, is, is, it the, is it the engine or is it the swing? I'm like, if we just make your engine 7% more powerful, 
your driver is going to be seven percent, be back to where you want, right? So the good news is we knew it was a, it was her. There was a body, a physical problem. So then we started started asking. I'm like, but your movement looks great. Like, like your flexible looks great. I'm like, I just got to ask you, like, what are you doing right now? And she goes, Well, I told you, like, I've been feeling off, so I think I'm getting weak. So I, I for the last five weeks, six weeks, I've been hitting the weights hard. I go, what does that mean, hitting the weights hard? And she's like, I've been doing a lot of heavy lifting. And I go, okay, hold on. So then we do a, we do a, a the vertical jump. I told you it was down 7%. We do a counter movement jump and then a hold, a static jump, right, to check. Kind of like uh, in our uh, FCS, the double. The dissected the- jump, yeah. Yeah, looking at the elastic jump. So we did a quick elastic jump on our horse plate over here. And the, the static jump versus the counter movement jump, there's no difference, right? The, like the elastic's gone, right? Gotcha. Um, so I look at it and I go, so hold on a second. I go, so right now you've been lifting heavy weights. I'm like, she normally does a lot of dynamic explosive stuff. And then she's like, yeah, no, I really haven't been doing it. I've just been doing strength training. And I'm like, okay, well, you do realize that strength training in general reduces your fast switch fibers and reduces some of your static. And this is like in, you know, in normal periodization, we would do strength training. And then as we taper, all those things come back. I go... Honestly, my honest opinion on doing all this evaluation on you right now is stop. You know, if you start <laughs> to taper your strength training, right, get more into some of your explosive stuff right now. In three weeks, I think you're going to be driving the ball farther than you have in, in, in six months ago. But I, I, I bring up this story because the movement screening, you know, really like you, we could have gone down a bad path really quick. Right. We could have started messing with our swing and like, oh, what have you done different with your stance or your grip and all that kind of stuff. But the movement screen said, hey, movement looks great. I look at the swing and I'm like, the swing still looks the same, right? So it's kind of weird. It's like people think that the movement screen has one purpose. But this this is like, it was help in the investigation to realize that she just was doing her periodization of training wrong, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like it's, I, again, I don't know if this applies to the story we were saying, but it no. kind of, it, it fits into the, is it a strength problem? Is it a, yeah, you know what I mean? I think it totally applies. And I want our listeners to go right back to where you started the story. Number one, you were working off a piece of baseline. You had a power signature and you had a quality and quantity signature and you had a movement signature, right? You basically said at the beginning of this, her grip strength went up and her movement remained the same, but we can't assume your body can convert that torque to, to rotational speed. It's there, but as long as you're in that stress recovery debt, yep. you'll never yep. express it because, but so I, I just think that was a, that was good because you couldn't have made that call without yep. the baseline that you had. Right. And then I, I remember, uh, this was probably five, six years ago when I was at the, one of the world golf fitness summits and we had almost the opposite effect. We had a guy with higher than average rotational speed he was constantly broken, and yep. and we went back, and we immediately found neck pain. I mean, he could generate the speed. His neck just didn't like his body spinning that much under his cantaloupe, yep. and and he was constantly jacked up from strength training. So the one, the one thing we saw both in the case study you just described, and I think maybe Adam or Andy can throw the case study uh, PowerPoint that I did from TPI up there, we've got two different opportunities where strength training was assumed to be beneficial for rotational power and speed. One was destroying the movement screen. One was maintaining it. One pointed us at, all right, finish that yep. training cycle. And one said, we got to go backward and reclaim movement. But, yep. you know, that's, that's just, those just kind so of baselines guys, uh, make, allow you to make those kind of quick changes and see the result. And just, just in case, uh, if you're watching this and you haven't seen some of the stuff on, on tapering, just to give you, just to make sure you followed that story is there's, if you, there's lots of research studies out there that'll show you this. If you take a group of people, like, let's say you take 60 couch potatoes, right? And you biopsy them and you look at their fast twitch, to slow twitch ratios. And let's say these, these couch potatoes have 10% fast twitch. If you get them off the couch and you say, go strength train for a month, heavy strength training. You know, a long time we used to, we weren't sure if you could actually change your fast twitch percentages versus slow twitch. For power, you want more fast twitch. If they were 10% fast twitch and you put them on a strength training program for one month and then you re-biopsy them Mm -hmm. and you looked at the average, we now know you can change that. You can influence the amount of fast twitch to slow twitch. The bad news is after that one month of strength training, the average goes from 10% to 3%, right? It goes down. (laughs) Strength training reduces your fast twitch. So you would say, like, why the hell would I ever do fast? Why would I ever do strength training if it's going to reduce my fast twitch? 
Well, the same research will say if you take those those people after one month and say stop working out, stop doing strength training, right? They can they can go back to their sport, do more ballistic type of stuff, or they can even just get back on the couch, right? And we say let's test your biopsy of your muscles every month. Within three months, I always ask some of our students this: Do you think it goes back to ten percent? The average person doesn't go back to ten percent. They go back to 20%. They double. It's called a rebound effect. So this, this rebound effect is how we can influence power by periodizing when we do strength training versus doing power. So she was actually getting the slow twitch increase during the strength. And now I'm going, perfect. Let's rebound this. Let's let's stop doing some of that. Go to more explosive stuff. Maintain your movements. And in a month or two, you're probably going to be out driving your, have your longest drive yet, right? So that just makes sure. All right. So, it. what I hear you also saying here is to youth baseball, tennis, golf coaches, strength training your kids three weeks before the season doesn't really do anything but make them a little slow and tired. And if the kids yeah. aren't strength training in their legitimate off season, then we well, really now, don't now have. <laughs> well, now you just opened up a can of worms because. Yeah. But let's 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 I'll talk golf and we can talk baseball. Uh, what's the off season in golf? Right. So here's the, the problem with most sports <laughs> now is they eliminate the off season. Right. So when you say to somebody, OK, when's a good time to reduce my fast switch? The answer is never. Right? Like, <laughs> like we have four weeks on the PGA Tour that we have off. Right. So it's a joke. Right. So in this I'm, this isn't this is a much bigger conversation <laughs> talking about problems with junior sports. But this is the reality. Right. Is as a strength coach, you have to now fit into the world of, well, every tournament matters and there's never a downtime. So you really do have to get really smart about micro periodization. And when you're doing strength, you can't just do strength on some of these sports like that. We have to time it with the same thing with explosive work so that we don't influence it in a negative way or we just agree all right, we're going to not drive it as far for the next month or two, but it's going to pay off when we get to the Masters in April, right? They're like so, so one of those things. But it's a difficult conversation now in a lot well, of sports. Well, what I've heard you both say, uh, Greg, is it, you know, you, guess, you just kind of went to one direction where how complicated it can be. But before yeah. you got to that point, you both were describing a process that you go through, no matter who walks in the door. You have a right. very, very much a specific process where you – do X, Y, Z, and based off that information, you then make a decision on what to do. You're not just going to yeah. go strength, somebody, strength train somebody. You're not going to just go power train. So walk us through that process if you – Yeah, well, so, Lee, that's a perfect example. Like I told you the field goal kicker was here yesterday, right? Never been here before. And he, he was referred by one of his good friends as a uh, MLB baseball pitcher that I work with. And he comes in. He's like, I've just never been on 3D biomechanics. I'm excited to do it. And I said, that's great. But that's what we're going to do last. Like, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go look at movement, right? So, Because it doesn't matter why you're here, right? I think you want us to answer your questions, right? So I always start with saying, like, how can I help you? Like, imagine I'm a genie and you just got three wishes. You know, how can I help you? Now, based on what you say, uh, it, would, it would steer me in maybe what we're going to do. But I can tell you for sure, no matter what you say, right, here's the things that I'm going to need before I open my mouth. Number one, I'm going to need a medical history. Number two is I need to know how you move. Now, that sounds like a little thing, but like I told you before, that's everything. Once I understand why you move or how you can move, it helps me understand why you swing that way or kick that way. And if you think about movement, you know, let's say I'm checking external rotation of the shoulder. If I check, uh, let's say, a pitcher and they go, okay, I can rotate to 120 degrees, does that mean they can only do 120 degrees? Well, actually, sometimes when you're dynamically striding down a mound and you have momentum, it goes from 120 to 160 degrees, right? So I go, I like to see how you move because it helps me understand what you can and can't do. And then I really want to see what you do in your sport. And that's when we do the biomechanics. So we go in and we look. And what's more important is this is how in my process is if you have a movement problem, let's say in the gym first, like let's say you can't do a, a, a shoulder mobility, right? Again, with dynamic movement in your sport, maybe it doesn't show up. But as you and I both know, a lot of times it does. And if I see the movement problem in your sport creating an efficiency problem on the mound and I match it with a movement problem in the gym, well, now that's a body sport connection. Those body sport connections is what makes my clipboard at the end, right? That's what we attack, right? And it's the same thing if you're a, an accountant, a secretary, a lawyer, I think it's the same thing that Gray and Lee, you guys are going to do the exact same thing. You're going to look at their movement. You're going to start talking about what do you do in your daily activity, and we're trying to find the link between the two. And it's actually not as hard as it sounds. 
No, I, one of the one of the things I've tried to use because of that exact thing we opened up that can of worms. Everybody doesn't think they have an off season, but they do have different phases of of the year. And I'm like, there's no time when your diet's not going to have some fat, some protein, and some carb. Three slices of pie, they fill up the yep. whole wheel macronutrient. If we looked at the reason we use exercise, training, and activity, it's either strength and endurance sort of in these stressful packages that cause a rebound, it's speed and power, and it's recovery exercise. And we need a lot of recovery exercise when we're in the hottest competition to dump mental tension, physical tension, get some circulation stuff. So what what I hear you saying is you're going to have all three slices of exercise in every phase of your year, but you get to say this is a big strength piece of pie and I don't need quite as much power and speed, but the recovery exercise is always going to be there. And if you're out By there way, prescribing an exercise and you don't know which one it is, there's a problem. The recovery, just to point out, in, in our programs, recovery is 50%. So yes. I'm like, if you're work, if you're gonna work out for two hours, that means we need two hours of recovery. So I'm like, just be careful. If you're a workout nut, you're recover, you're gonna be spending half your day with workout and recovery because I'm trying to match those, right? And that that's really important. I think a lot of people don't. No, I think it is, and it it's back to the durability thing, right? Like I want my athlete to do this for 40 years, right? So just start if you start thinking 40 years, your whole perspective changes. And I want my players to play the next day feeling like they didn't play the day before. How do you do that, right? That, that's the key. If they go in the gym and they feel like, oh, I just beat myself up more, that's not what you want to do. You want them leaving the gym going, I feel better, and when I'm done with my recovery part, I really feel like when I wake up in the morning, like I didn't do anything the day before. Even though you, you freaking played 18 holes or you had a game and you killed yourself yesterday, you, you can't feel like that the next day or else you're, you're leaving something on the table. So I'd leave our listeners with that. Every time you're programming an athlete, all three slices of pie need to be identified. You need to know which exercise or which. When we came up with those very light carries, like the six position carries and stuff, or a little bit of Indian club stuff, or just some jump rope packages, these are things that are low tech, low mental skill level. They're, they're rhythmical or they're just enough to make you balance better. So stuff on the balance beam, th- those look low tech, uh, but they're unbelievable for recovery, especially people that cross the midline, get a little scrambled sometimes. It, it brings it back. Quant conversation last week, you came up, Mike Voigt and I were talking, and remember the age-old controversy we've had about asymmetry on the FMS. Greg yep. Rose, and I quote you, if I don't see asymmetry and you're in a unilateral sport, I know you're not practicing enough. Gray yep. Cook, Lee Burton, if we see too much asymmetry, we know that's going to interfere with everything, including your practice. And so yep. Mike and I were saying, how can we talk about the asymmetry that's acceptable versus unacceptable? Numerically, we say, if it's got a one in it on the FMS, you could probably do a little bit better. You don't have to carry that much baggage. Um, but you're never going to be perfectly symmetrical in asymmetrical sports. So what we started saying is a 2-3 asymmetry is um, a non-infectious asymmetry. A 1-3 is probably going to grab some efficiency from you um, in some form of your durability, your fatigue management, or your skill acquisition. Yep. Well, the, the kicker I, I, better have an asymmetry that you saw yesterday. <laughs> you notice well, you know, a little one? It, it cracks me up. I think we might have talked about this before on a, a past podcast, but – you know, well, obviously we have a station at the NFL Combine, NHL Combine, and I think a lot of people when they go to the Combines, these elite athletes, they're preparing to kick butt at the Combine, right? I mean, that's that's the goal is to, to be the best at the Combine. And I think some people look at every station and go, I got to be the best. They look at FMS and they go, I got to get a 21, right? <laughs> if, a quarterback gets, if a quarterback gets a 21, I'm going to tell the team not to draft them, right? <laughs> I'm just pointing out, right? I mean, they're, I'm like, that, that overhead throwing athlete – should not have a symmetrical shoulder mobility. I, that's just, that doesn't make any sense. So I'm always like, listen, if, if we know like a 17 or an 18 and you can get 17 or 18 in a million different ways, if we know you've got that in the right way with the right asymmetric or the advantageous asymmetries, right? Keeping them in that little sweet spot of like a 17 or 18 because of the right asymmetries is the art of training elite athletes, right? Because like you said, great, if you practice too much, Right? So if, if they don't work out enough, they just throw too much, Yes. well, the asymmetries get too big to the point where now they, they're not advantageous asymmetries. They can become problematic asymmetries. 
if they train too hard in the gym, they become too balanced and they lose the asymmetries. Now they don't have the advantageous asymmetry. So for us, we use the FMS as like for volume control. Like, are you working out enough? Are you throwing enough? And if we do that in the right balance, we got the, we got the perfect, we call it the, the metal bracket or the ja- jacket bracket in golf. Like we're keeping you in the right bracket. That, I mean, that's, that's the art of, of coaching in my opinion. I've been trying to cultivate the way I, I talk about structure and function. And structure, when, when you get a one on the movement screen or have a, a DN, and, and there's some mobility involved, measurable mobility, both at the impairment level and at the big movement level, you've got a little structural change there. It takes time for muscle, fascia, tendon, bone, cartilage, joint, ligament to adapt. And so now you're looking at the four to six week, you know, minimal. Whereas function is very plastic. So I think we all in our own little wheelhouse will use something like toe touch progression or rolling or something just to show people how plastic function is. We run up against the same structural barriers as everybody does, and we keep tapping at those so they change too. But whenever any of us is able to see or, or measure a movement problem and then create that single episode reset, we know there's a lot of plastic functional upgrade. And every day, if the warm up reignites some of that, we, we've got a viable four to, six, four to six weeks adaptation in muscle, muscle memory, tissue, whatever. But, but it's when I see those people where we throw a really good movement nutrient at them and they only upgrade a little bit, I'm like, all right, we're going to be here for a while. That's no reason not to do it. It's just not as go, going to go quite as fast as it did for Greg on stage the last right. week. Right. Well, it just, it, you know what it does to me? It's like we talk about this in motor learning and motor patterns is – if you do the toe touch pattern and all of a sudden they can touch their toes and it's telling me that motor pattern's there. They've already, they already know it. It's just been buried under a, a lot of baggage, right? right. And we just got to get the baggage out of the way and get that old pattern. If, if we do this and there's a little bit of improvement, but it's not this like shock and awe, well, you're probably building a new pattern now too. So not only do we have, we have dysfunction there, but we actually don't have a rooted correct pattern that was developed in the first place. And you're right, those take longer, right? So, but it, it, it actually helps you understand, again, back to volume, like the person who I already know they have this motor pattern, they learned how to do it when they were a kid. Uh, I just got to remind them how to do this. Our volumes aren't going to be like when we're building a motor pattern, right? Yeah. Totally different. So we're going to take a quick break, and we come back. Greg's going to walk us through some of the things he's doing to improve rotary power. As a healthcare professional, most of your patients likely walk through your door already experiencing pain. The SFMA is your initial assessment and provides a differential diagnosis that leads to more efficient treatment. And now it is easier than ever to get certified by signing up for one of our SFMA live virtual courses. We offer SFMA Level 1 and 2 virtual courses online, guided by a live instructor who will take you through the entire process. You'll be able to ask our team questions in real time and watch instructors work through live models throughout the day to be sure you leave with a clear understanding and the ability to start implementing the SFMA into your own practice. And for a limited time, we'd like to offer our podcast listeners a special rate for this SFMA virtual training experience. Follow the link in the show notes and use promo code VERT22 at checkout for $50 off your virtual SFMA Level 1 or Level 2 certification courses. That's V-I-R-T-2-2. And if you bundle them at checkout, you'll save an additional $220 automatically. We look forward to you joining us. Now back to the show. So Greg, we kind of we talked a, a lot about mobility, stability, looking at movement. And once those things are cleared, what are some of the things that, that you're doing, maybe some of the new things, kind of tricks or things that you know, you could share with us right now to improve someone's power. Okay, well, I'll tell you, one of the, I don't say it's new, but one of the new frontiers I think that a lot of the sports science is getting into is ground force and, and ground reaction forces and how, how players use the ground. And I always like to preface this, that whenever we're trying to look at uh, an athlete and trying to figure out how to make them more powerful, you always want to ask the what, the why, and the how, right? So if you want to know what they're doing, you watch them, you take a video, 3D motion capture that tells you what they're doing, like how much they're turning their hips and where the club is, and that's what, right? If you wanna know why they're doing that, well, that's back to the movement screen, that's maybe mental, what they're thinking, but if you wanna know how they actually do it, that's force plates, right? Pressure and force plates tells me 
how you move to the left, how you move to the right. Because there's actually a million ways to rotate to the right. There's a million ways of how to move to the left. It's starting to give us a lot of insight on how the best players in the world actually move. So I think one of the cool things about power development we're looking at now is there are some very common signatures of rotary athletes of how they create this power from the ground. And uh, I, uh, something cool that, that uh, I can show you that you guys can try at home is if you have like a rotary chair, any chair that moves, right? And you guys can see me back here. Like a swivel stool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, right. So I got this, I actually bought this, this chair and we put rollerblade wheels on this. We have all different types of rotary chairs here because we actually use it as part of our training, you know, aids. It's like, it's another piece of equipment in your gym that can be really beneficial just be careful. I like the ones that have wide base so that players don't fall over. Mm -hmm. And what I do with my players is this, just to show them how important the ground is. And this way it leads into everything we look at SFMA with ankle mobility and stability. It just shows how all these are connecting. Is I take, let's say I'm a right-handed rotary athlete. So I'm, I'm rotating to the left. Let's say I'm hitting a hockey stick, baseball, throwing, anything rotating to the left for a right-handed player. I have them sit on a rotary chair like this and I say, do me a favor, with your feet on the ground, just go ahead and rotate to the left, right? I'm like, don't fall off the chair, but rotate to the left. And they all, they all do it, and they do it in a different way. How they use the ground to rotate is what we're gonna talk about here in a second, but they basically rotate. Then I say, do me a favor, take your feet off the ground, you can try this at home, and I say, now rotate to the left. And they usually look at you like, coach, I don't even know where to start. And I go, that's the whole point. Without the ground, it's, you, it's hard, you can't even create rotation, right? So I say, first of all, now you understand how important the ground is. What I want to do is I want to test how you use the ground. And it's amazing to me, I call this the poor man's force plate on how well this translates to what we see on our force plates by testing them on a rotary chair. And one of the tests we do is this. I say, take your left foot off the ground, just using your right foot, rotate to the left, right? And if you're at home watching this and you're following along, do this with me, right? So you right foot's on the chair, and right foot's on the ground and you rotate. Now do it twice and then ask yourself, what part of your foot are you pushing from, right? And you do it again and pay attention and pay attention to what you're pushing from. And then do the same experiment on the left leg. And again, we're always rotating to the left. A rotary athlete, we're rotating, uh, our primary contact is rotating left. So I take the left foot and I rotate to the left as well. And I'm telling you, if you guys try this there too, you would see that some players, some athletes, you get them with their right foot and they can rotate. Some athletes get them on the right foot and they, they struggle rotating. Some you put them on their left leg and they literally don't even know how to use the left leg and some know how to use the left leg. And you'll see that translate into their rotary sport because what we see with the best players in the world is there are a couple types of torques that you create in the golf, in the golf swing, baseball swing, tennis. There's a, a torque, torque is a pushing and pulling. There's a twisting torque. Right, so twisting, I call these guys the twisters. This is called horizontal plane torque. They can twist really, really well. And then there's what I call rocket rollers. This is what's called frontal plane torque. And the best players in the world, best rotary athletes, have a little bit of frontal plane and a little bit of twisting. They do a little bit of both, right? And this, these two torques help create power. And if you think about it, like the ability to do this and the ability to do this is why we look at all these movements that we look at, because it's ultimately what's gonna turn into power. When you're on the chair here, the chair is one of the best ways to evaluate twisting, horizontal torque, right? Not the greatest for rock and roll, but it's one of the best for twisters. But like I said, that's, that's a big component for rotary athletes. And what we've noticed is that the best players in the world, if you look at their signatures on a force plate, what they're gonna do is they're gonna, on their trail leg, on the trail leg, they're actually gonna push the ground backwards. When they push the ground backwards, what does the ground do? the ground pushes forward, right? So when they push the ground backwards, the ground pushes forward and it helps them rotate their body. With the lead leg, they push the lead leg forward because when they push the lead leg forward, the ground pushes the lead side backwards. And it's this couple, this force couple called a torque that helps them create rotary power. So when you're on a chair, the most ideal pressure points where you should feel your feet is when you're using your left leg, you should be pushing from the ball of your left foot. Ball of the left foot, rotates you to the left. You should be pushing from the inside heel of your right foot. This is what we see with the most powerful rotary athletes, is they push backwards with the right foot, forward with the left foot, right? Now, I, 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 you might be saying, okay, so who cares? I've found that 
if you give them the appropriate mobility and stability in their ankles, hips, spine, and then you show them how to use it, we get the best bang for the buck. So in other words, one of the most frustrating things in the world is an athlete comes in, you do all your movement testing, you improve their movement, and they go, coach, I don't notice the difference when I go play, there's no distance. Well, did anybody show you how to use that now, right? This is, I, I feel like the missing link to a lot of these is you've got to take that now to the skill to see the, the expression of this. So the reason I'm showing you these, these little things with the chair is because we've integrated this into a lot of the exercises and drills we do, right? Just so one point and then I'll talk about the exercises. Once I evaluate left and right foot, it's very obvious. You'll see which leg is their problem and it'll show up on their sport as well. Just so you know, most great rotary athletes, they're better with their lead side than their trail side. Wow. And that's because the lead side actually creates almost 150 to 200% more power than the trail side when we look on the force plate. I don't know if you guys have a rotary chair there, but you'll see a lot of people don't even know how to use their left leg, right? And when we, we take these athletes and when you watch them in the force plate, you're going to see they actually, they'll create way more torque coming from that lead side than the trail side. So I think you guys have all seen, like when we talk about power medicine ball drills, right? You've seen people like take a medicine ball and I'm sorry, I'm in my 3D bay, I'm not in my gym. But if I grab a medicine ball, like imagine I got a medicine ball here and I'm throwing the medicine ball. You guys have probably seen athletes do this all the time called a shovel pass, right? And maybe we can link, they could show you a video on our website, but basically that's like a shovel pass. Now to me, this is, I see a lot of athletes doing this all the time. But then you go watch a really powerful athlete, and when a really powerful athlete does this, it's their, their legs are doing something totally different. When they step, they push the ground, and the ground accelerates the ball versus their upper body accelerating the ball. And um, maybe we can link to a video here. I could show you a video of one of our world long drive champions doing a shovel pass. And when you see this, you'll see that if you watch the front leg, watch the ground forces happening. And I feel like this is the ultimate expression of what we're trying to do when we look at movement. We're trying to take this movement and then teach them how to use that movement that they have now to create ultimate power. And I'm telling you, Lee, to back to your question, one of the biggest missing links now is taking all this stuff and making it show up in their sport, right? And that's where I think a lot of the connecting the, the movement to the coaching is, I think, the biggest advancement that we've seen over the last two years is we're now being able to show them how to use that new mobility and stability in a more effective way when they actually do the gym to connect to their, their athletic movement. Now, one thing I loved is what you showed us on the stool, Greg. I think before you ever give somebody a, a exercise or anything, just letting them become self-aware, right? They're still rotating, but the fact that you can help them focus on the, the weakest link just by that simple oh, they, kinetic they feel, drill. They feel right away. They'll be like, my God, I, I, I'm not even using my left leg. I don't know what's going on. No, and that's why I love it because a lot of, pe a lot of times people will see us use uh, an awareness drill and they'll think that's our exercise, right? But we're just doing it to create a, um, how can I say, a kinetic picture of what okay. I would rather not have to verbalize to you. The minute you know that you have absolutely, you know, no push off of that front leg, uh, the point has been made. Anything yeah. that changes that without turning the stool into your one and only exercise is probably gone to the authentic absence of that ability yeah. or remove the I, impairment. I, so back to back to finish the your question is what like what's new and like power. Think about like FMS. Think about SFMA. Think about the movement screens. Right now we've always been looking at what and why, right? Like. Here's what they can do. Like they can only get to so far. They can, they can't squat down to their ankle doesn't do this or why? Well, maybe there's a mobility problem. But I think the future piece that we're going to be adding in here is if if you can squat, maybe we should be asking how you squat, right? Because potentially how you're using your your patterning, your sequencing, and even the ground forces, I believe, could be different between normal squats. If you want to take this to another level, right, of adding the three pieces on there, which is what I think. Uh, I think it's the future. There's always cool stuff to be looking at, and I think that's a big one. Well, I want to take us to one more place. We, okay. we so often uncover mobility problems. I mean, in our sports medicine work, we see the ankle all the time, and they're never a match set of tight ankles. There's usually one. We come up with the hip injury, the shoulder injury, the T-spine's all going one way. We've got hernias. We've got sports hernia. we got all this stuff going on. 
And the low-hanging fruit is, listen, manage mobility up front. But a lot of people who come at something with maybe a single mobility measure don't realize you're also capturing quite a bit of stability. And, and you and I had this uh, experience, and I was at TPI. We were looking at one of your golfers, and it was early in the SFMA. You were using golf screens. We were using balance tests, and I had my dry needles, and you had a bunch of tools. And we saw an athlete have a standing rotation limitation probably to the left. We yep. took them down to kneeling and seating. They were easily more locked up to the right. We took them into a rolling pattern. They were dysfunctional again in the opposite direction. Then we took them to the table and started doing mobility testing, and nothing was there. So we had three different mobility tests. They didn't disagree with you. They didn't agree with each other at all. You and I cleared the exact same tissue, unloaded with our hands, and said what looked like an inconsistent mobility problem was nothing but a stability problem hiding until we got this spine on the ground and it said, okay, I'll drop this protective tone now. But give us, oh, dude, give actually, us that story. Actually, yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. So the, the, the person you're talking about is Corey Pavin, former U.S. Open champion, championship <laughs> player, one of the best golfers of all time, right? And uh, Corey was, was in because uh, power. He wanted to hit the ball farther. It was, he, was, he was always one of the shorter hitters. And um, so as with every player, it doesn't matter what level you are, what are we going to start with? The movement screen, right? So uh, I did a, to tell you the, the from my recollection, was we started with multi-segmental rotation. Uh, when I saw multi-segmental rotation, he was severely restricted turning right, like backswing. Okay, yep. And I'm, yeah, I'm like, that makes sense because really there's three, there's only three ways to hit a ball farther, right? You can either apply more force to the, to the, to the club, right? Because power is force times velocity. You can apply more force. You can move the club faster, velocity, right? So power is force times velocity. So the two ways that a ball farther is apply more force or move the club faster. The third way is take that power, that force and velocity, and apply it over a greater amount of time. In other words, like if I put you on a chair with wheels and you're one foot away from a wall and I push you into the wall, I can hurt you, but I can't kill you. If we get 20 feet away from the wall and I have 20 <laughs> feet of running time, I have more time to apply that force and velocity, we can do some damage. This is Next time we run out of Marriott, let's let's do that experiment. I, I got some people I'd like. <laughs> That's what I'm so, <laughs> here's the, here's the, the one of the things on my head's going, well, oh man, you're restricted in your backswing. And that's not now you since you don't have a long backswing, you don't have enough time to apply the force and power. And this is great. We get you more backswing, you'll be able to hit the ball farther, right? So I'm like, let's try and figure out why the hell you can't rotate to the right. So we go to seat it. So we sit down and put a club behind them, and we say, go ahead and let's rotate right. And he rotates right. And he clears our seated test. It goes to like 50 degrees. I'm like, man, it was clearly obvious that he couldn't rotate right. And I'm like, well, maybe it's maybe it's the hips, right? Because the hips aren't standing. I'm like, well, let's just check left. We go left rotation, and left was like 25 degrees. And I'm like, wait a second. I go left was clear standing, <laughs> right is over here. And I'm like, okay, hold on. Let's let's something does make sense. Let's go to lumbar lock. So we go to lumbar lock, and again, left is restricted, right is clear. Go back to standing. Right's restricted, left is clear. Uh, and at that point, I looked over and I go, hey, Gray, help. <laughs> right, so, I go, so, so Gray goes, all right, I go, dude, check out the freak, right? And Corey's like, what do you mean? I'm like, never mind, stand over here. So he shows, we show this to Gray, and Gray was like, let's, let's check rolling, right? So we get down to rolling, and I mean, it, it, was, it was like a five-month-old child. Like, like I, Corey will laugh at this. Like, I, I don't think he'll mind me saying this, but... He was like, what the hell? I can't roll over, right? <laughs> nah, nah, like, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> so we just gave each other a high five and we walked out. No. So we, we, he's like, what the hell's going on? So we we work on his so – we, we were like, let's just fix rolling, right? So Greg gives him some exercises. We got some rolling patterns. We get them, and all of a sudden – it didn't take long. I mean, how long was that? Like maybe five minutes maximum, right? Five yeah. minutes. We got him rolling. So he's rolling. So he goes, okay, so now what? And I go, uh, stand up, let's see. And he rotates, multi segment rotation, right rotation, clear. Left rotation, clear. I go, I go, looks good. He goes, so what do I need to do? And I go, we'll probably give you a couple of little rolling exercises. You just, you'll do a couple of these. But, uh, and he goes, well, what, what, 
what the hell just like, what the hell was that? Like, because, you know, they can feel this, right? And I don't know if you remember this, but you can see like he was like, wait, that's all I got to do is I just got to be rolling. And I'm like, well, we can make this harder if you want. <laughs> you know, we can we can start giving you all these mobility exercises, but this isn't a mobility problem. Right. Right. And he's like, explain to me what happened. And I always feel like this is hard to explain to athletes like, you know, the stability thing. Like, how, how do you explain that? And and again, I know if you're listening, you might have all kinds of degrees behind your name and you can go through the science. Don't do that with athletes. Right. I just said, hey, listen, Corey, there's. There's this switch inside your body, right? And when things are working right, the switch is on, right? But for some reason, we don't know why, sometimes this switch gets turned off. And when the switch gets turned off, just simple things like which muscles should fire and which patterns become challenging. And for some reason, your switch is off. And by doing these little stupid things, it just turns the switch back on and you can do it now. And he kind of looked at me like, really? And I'm like, do you want to make it harder or is that good, you know, is that good enough? And I, I don't know if you remember the rest of this story, but uh, Corey was struggling for almost five years, not doing well. But three weeks later, this is, I can't remember the year here, but this, we're going back here to uh, uh, early 2000s. But four weeks later, he gets to Bay Hill, finishes top top five in Bay Hill, and then he wins two weeks later on a tour. And he gave us props during the interview on that. <laughs> uh, I mean, rolling changes somebody's ability to, you know, go out there and perform at the well, high yeah, but the Yeah, but the key right there, though, that, again, it still goes back to you guys figuring out Getting to that yeah. one, that first domino, right? You got to knock well, over the first domino. He wanted to go into stretching, like he wanted to go into right. some manual work. Yeah, and you, you have to get to that point and use the lo- use the logic and the decision yep. tree to say, well, it's not this, it's not this. You really don't. If it's inconsistent, right? Then it's probably going to be more of a motor control problem. And a motor control problem, typically, would you guys agree? You can reset that a little bit quicker. You you absolutely can because it's nothing. It's nothing but turning your phone off and turning it back on, and it runs a little bit better. I want people to hear this: when we stretch you out, when if your lack of mobility is a result of inappropriate tone, we can we can ART you, we can dry needle you, we can scrape you, we can tape you, and we can make that muscle tone submit, or we can take you to a level that's non-threatening and actually let you flow the way you want to. But until we take you to a non-threatening position, and and even though rolling is extremely hard for some people, I've never seen it be painful for anybody. It's painful when they can't go to one side. But I recall being at the at the Colts a, a long time ago. This is when Adam Vinatieri was with them. And one side of his body was bruised like he'd been in a, a fight. And it was just the amount of soft tissue he was using to keep his body balanced. We went through the exact same rolling and literally, it was like he was on a hill. One side was like going uphill. One side was like going downhill. And we just, we breathe, man, just relax and do this. He overcame it. But at the end of about a five-minute rolling session, he had gained the half kneeling mobility and ro- rotation left to right that it used to take him 35 minutes of soft tissue and a lot of pain to get. So, you know, sometimes we do need to get that tissue, but so many people without a few tiers of testing and a few levels of breakouts will cease a lack of motion and go right into lengthening strategies instead of let's unburden this posture first. And and rolling is ground zero. And it's taught me more than I've taught about rolling ever will. But, but what I want you guys to hear is Greg just went down the rabbit hole we could have easily bullshitted or fabricated seven different answers of why that did, but there was a lot of transparency. It's inconsistent, but I do know mobility problems are consistent at both the global movement and local movement measurement level. If you've got ankle mobility problems, we usually see you can't squat well, and then we can measure on goniometry, you got ankle mobility problems. When we see one and not the other, that's an inconsistency, and we should yep. put our thinking caps on, try to recalibrate the system before we make it submit. That's Th- that's, what made, that's what made him buy in, too, because I was like, let's, let's just think about it. Like, mobility doesn't change, right? Like, it's not like all of a sudden, magically, your hamstring length increases. Like, I'm like, why can you turn here, but you can't turn here? And he's like, no, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, that's not a mobility problem. Like, there's no, what am I going to stretch? What am I going to adjust, right? Like, and, and uh, I, it, I think a lot of people in our classes that take SFMA too, I think they freak out when they get the S- the SMCDs, the mobility, the motor control problems, because mm-hmm. they're like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, you shouldn't freak out. You should be excited because these are the easy things to fix. The mobility things suck, right? That, that, that takes harder work, right? 
not that we can't fix them, but I'm like, when I see an SMCD, I'm like, man, it's going to make me look like a rock star. This person's going to be like, I've been to 30 people and I've been getting treated and nothing works. And all of a sudden in five minutes, I can do this now. That's SMCDs. Get excited about those. Yeah. Stability and motor control dysfunction is what he's saying. And that's our language from the SFMA. But, but Greg, we've both seen amazing stuff in the PNF world, in, in the DNS world. And that's where if you don't have a mobility problem, some of these primal positions and, and rolling is our low hanging fruit, because if you're good at rolling, I think you can not necessarily hack, but it's a really good catch all there. There's a much deeper tangent. Those people in DNS have, have unearthed, but even then, if you're doing all of that central programming stuff and, and you've left a peripheral mobility problem, I remember you going to a course and saying, yeah, but you didn't clear the ankles. So we see rolling make single leg stance better unless you don't clear the hip and ankle from a mobility problem that's poisoning single leg stance. So everybody gets sure. into one pocket and tries to yeah. practice, but, but right. back out. Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure that you said, I've never seen rolling hurt anybody. Well, if they have a mobility problem, rolling can hurt somebody, right? So if you're applying the wrong tool to the wrong spot, right? So it's really important that we're talking about SMCDs or stability motor control problems, that rolling is a great catch-all. But if you take somebody who doesn't have thorax mobility or hip mobility and you ask them to roll, yeah, they're going to suck at rolling. They're not going to be able to do it, but it's not because of the switches off, right? They don't have mobility. And that's we use a different tool to attack that. No, I, I love using just some rolling and, and posterior rocking calibrations after manipulation, dry needling, and everything, but it means more if you lay those baselines first. So let me see an absence of rolling. Let me do what I've got to do to rack and stack you and crack you, whatever the reset is. Usually, you'll have a spontaneous emergence of rolling. We see the same thing with multifidus testing, and we talked about this with Kyle on our, on our low back pain episode, but... When, when I have a rolling signature of a deficiency in a quadrant or in a direction, I use a quick manual therapy reset, rolling spontaneously emerges. If we don't reinforce that with some simple rolling and breathing at home, they're going to come back and need the same manual therapy. And they'll probably still get it again next time, but I'd like to see a third of that real estate to two-thirds of that real estate maintained by them. And the thing I recommended you know, and I think that's getting even easier. We've got apps, we've got videos. People can do some of these calibrations. And I would have rather, and I'm sure you told Corey this because I don't remember, but rolling a few times a day is way better than doing anything to exhaustion once every other day, especially when we're nurturing that timing back up. So I, I think the, the, the one thing, sorry, Greg, the one thing, or a couple things here, uh, listen to you guys talk. One, don't just put everybody down on the floor and start rolling them. Right. That's not going to fix. That's not going to fix everything. But it's a good place to start if you have a stability problem. And then the other thing is, don't assume that somebody who looks like they're tight, that it's a mobility problem. Don't make that assumption. I think that's far too often in our profession. Someone looks at them and they, they do a movement screen and they see somebody rotate. They heard Greg or Gray talk and they do the toe touch and they're tight. And then they put them on their back and start trying to stretch them out. That's, that's definitely not not the case. You've got to take a little bit deeper step. And my question, Greg, to you is, is would you argue or not argue, would you say that people in your, who you deal with at the elite level that generate a lot of power, are they more mobile or more stable, generally speaking? Dude, that's the, the people ask this all the time, right? Because they, they, I think, I think a lot of people think that you know, we say mobility trumps stability, that it's more important than stability. And we say that because, number one, it's true. <laughs> number two is we say that is because it's hard to even evaluate stability without mobility. But what's really, really important here, and I'll get back to your question in a second, Lee, is that, is that mobility, when we say the word mobility, that's not the same as flexibility. And I, but the reason I say that is when I say flexibility, I think people think stretching. Mobility is the ability to move your joints the way they were designed. I don't want hypermobility. I just want normal mobility. Now, how I can get mobility is I can do stretches, I can do strength training, I can use kettlebells, I can use foam rollers. There's a million ways to get mobility. So we're not saying is stretching more important than strengthening. We're saying mobility 
precedes stability. If you don't have the mobility, you like if I if I don't have the mobility, I don't even know how to evaluate stability, right? So now when you say what's more important or what do pro athletes have more mobility and stability, I would say if if anybody looks at let's say you go look at Mike Trout or go look at some of the b- biggest hitters Paul Goldschmidt in baseball or look at some of the big guys in in the PGA Tour and they go yeah but some of these big guys are tight, you obviously have not worked with great athletes right because the great athletes that I've worked with 100% have normal mobility. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna say everybody has their issues. They might have I have a bad ankle like John Rahm, number one player in the world has a bad right ankle. He was born with club foot. Okay, so he's got a mobility problem with his right ankle. But they look at him and they're like, he's got this short swing. Man, he must be thick and tight. And it pisses him off because if you go look at his movements, he's got incredible mobility, right? Now, I'm not saying hypermobility. Hypermobility is just as big a problem as hypomobility, right? We're saying normal mobility. I hate when the people out there say, oh, you know, you don't really need mobility to be a great athlete. Uh, that's total BS. I don't see that. I have not seen a great athlete that doesn't have normal range of motion where they need it to be able to, to, to perform their, their sport, right? So I would say the answer is what's more important or what do they have more of? The answer is yes, they have both, <laughs> right? But, but, I, but um, I can't, I, I think the question more is, is, is if people are thinking what's more important, stretching or strength training, that's a whole different conversation, right? You can get mobility with strength training. Really I believe nice. I'd almost argue right now, and I think you know I'm going to say this and then have to go pull some data to prove it. But I think right now it seems like to me more people are hypermobile than they have been in the past. And and I'm just I'm kind of saying that just based off of you know just seeing some people talking to some people. But I think there may be some data out there that I could probably pull from. I well, like that's kind of where I I wanted to have this conversation. Lee, is that I think when we say we want normal mobility, we're not saying hypermobility. We're saying normal mobility. And when someone says, oh, it's okay to be tight, sometimes they're going, well, normal's 50. I just don't want them to be 70. I'm like, well, me neither, but that's not tight. Normal is 50. That's normal, right? So I'm talking about spine rotation. So I, I, I feel like uh, people understand the importance of mobility now, Lee. So I think maybe more of the training programs are incorporating some of that. But there can be some, let's say, you know, great athletes are great athletes because they're obsessive compulsive and they work hard, Right. So if you tell me mobility is important, it's really easy to overdo anything. Just like it's really easy to get too much into strength training and all of a sudden you lose your mobility, uh, they can go both directions for sure. Yep. And, and I, it could be that more people are even, as you said, training for it, but actually testing it. The more you test something, the more you you can find something you may not be looking for. True. But but I think Lee's right. There, there's a spectrum of hypermobility now. So whether you want to go all the way to ALARS down low s- syndrome, right. but I think they've been tracking it in the UK longer than we have. And they've seen, you know, uh, I, I think there's a spectrum there. We, we, we see increasing uh, asthma, autism, and hypermobility, and they sort of run in that. And people could blame, you know, toxic environments or, you know, a lot of different inputs the the fact is if you got a system that finds normal mobility a lack of normal mobility and also hypermobility you'll know exactly what to do with them i mean the, there's you know and but I, I, I don't really see that i'm t- i'm telling you like i know it looks like a lot of these guys are hyper but when we test and i'm testing some sports that typically people think of really flexible athletes i don't see a lot of hypermobility i see some don't get me wrong we see some of that but i see way more hypomobility right so in general you should always try and get to normal mobility. Don't think tight is good because we don't see that with, with – I'm talking golfers, tennis players, baseball players, rotary athletes. We don't see that. Well, that's a good place for us to wrap it to because even though the scoring system in the FMS is simple, a 2-3 asymmetry means you're good, but you're also great on the other side as opposed to meaning you're dis- deficient or dysfunctional on one side and good or great on the other. And so a one anywhere or a zero anywhere is just going to be unnecessary baggage. And if you can't tell where it's coming from, that's why we flip the card and switch and pivot and do the SFMA. But seriously, arguing, you don't, you, you need to argue for the presence of asymmetry in asymmetrical sports, but not, not the toxic asymmetry that's easily a result of maybe just a lack of awareness somewhere. And that, that's where I'm, I'm really trying to go is make sure the person you're working with is aware of, of what you're doing, how many different filters you're using, and then make sure they're protecting the downside. You know, we're, we're, we talk about rotation power and, and speed. Don't have posture problems. Don't have balance problems. Don't have mobility problems. All right, Greg, now what's the program for <laughs> power and right. speed? You know, it's... Yeah. 
protect the downside before you try to, you know, announce a correction. So I think the argument's always like people are always like, well, okay, would you rather have a, a tight bow and arrow or a loose string on a bow and arrow? Like, which one's going to shoot it farther? Like, let's we'll say the tight one, you know, shoots stronger. So you should be tight, right? Because that would make you more explosive. I like, again, once again, I would agree with that if the best, most powerful athletes were like that. We just don't see that, right? We see normal range of motion in their hips, normal range of motion in their spine. Now, they might have more elastic tension, fascial tension, some stuff like that to create some of the elastic power, but I don't see reduced range of motion, especially central trunk, spine rotation, hip rotation, shoulder rotation. We just don't see it. No, let's, let's we be don't, honest. We don't see hyper either. Yeah. Everybody's got a shot at playing at an elite level. And that elite level is going to have a natural selective quality to it. So we're going to get people on the stiff side of the spectrum and the sloppy side of the spectrum. And if they make it through that, that narrow, that razor's edge, the, the sloppy people will find programming that keeps them a little toned and tightened up. And the stiff people will ultimately get loosened up. And, and so what, the reason I don't think you see it where you are, Greg, is because those people who are a little sloppy or stiff got down the razor's edge and figured out, I need more mobility work just to keep the slot. And the other person never stretches, but they do a little bit of their motor control work and they get the same slot. So well, I would say that the, the guys that spend the long, the long term guys, the one that who, who are playing the 40 years, Greg, they yep. figured something out. They know yep. how to keep their body tuned up. They're not, they're not doing anything, I would argue, extreme. And I think yep. that's that's somewhat what I'm hearing you guys say is, yep. you know, keep it keep it kind of in that in that slot. Um, let's yeah. not go too far one way or the other. Well, you know, we have a, we have an experiment going on right now in the PGA Tour. Not we, but there is a person on the PGA Tour, Bryson DeChambeau, that has been trying to go to the extreme, like going to the heavy power lifting, heavy strength. Uh, it's been directed by Greg Roscoff at, at MAT, um, so he's got some supervision there. Um, but it, it's going to be interesting to, to see when you get to the durability versus performance. He's obviously proven that if we take the extreme to strength and power, there's an advantage, and he's played incredibly well. But uh, there's also been some injuries and some things along the way that will will be proven on the durability stuff. But like you just said, I, I agree 100%. If you're thinking 40 years, that's that's probably not the wisest. Um, uh, that this this minimal effective dose tends to last the longest, and we've had some incredible success doing that with a lot of players. No, perfect. Well, thank you for being here, and uh, I get to go be on the tractor. You're stuck in San Diego, and your tractor's in Arkansas, so you don't get to be on it. I'll go (laughs) pretend to be a redneck next month, but here, now it's time to work. Exactly. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, you, brother. You didn't want to see that, right? I'm loving it. No, we don't need to see that. (laughs) Not from one of the elite elite power trainers in the in the sports world, right there. That's what you want to see. That's what you. That's what you get. Farm. That's a true redneck tan, right there, Greg. But we have sleeves. We have we have sleeves in California, so you know it changes things. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, boys. Thanks, man. Thank you, man. We'll see you. See See you. That will do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please take a minute and subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your own movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.